have a few um, announcements. I have one major announcement actually, and I want to make it quickly before we go into the world. Um, beginning, starting from next Sunday, we will start a two-service worship experience. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Our first worship, our first, first, first um, service will kick in at 3 p.m. And that's our empowerment service. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's our empowerment service. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. Um, because we want to teach us life skills as well. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. As big as we will be and we are in our spirit, we still, and what's the word? We still do in the flesh. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, the Bible says it like this we are in this world, but we are not of this world. But you see, we go to the same markets as those in the world. We work in the same offices as those in the world. We go to the same hospitals. We attend the same job interviews. We do everything as those in the world. And the Bible says something about the children of this world, that they are very cunning. Hallelujah. Amen. Everything that makes for success is found from the word of God. And so beginning from next Sunday at 3 p.m., our first um, empowerment service will kick in. Hallelujah. Amen. At 3 p.m. That will run till about 4.15. That service will run till about 4.15 and then the main service will begin to get ready to take over. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Of course, volunteers, that means that your service is now on Saturday morning, immediately after the um, after the prayer meeting. So the teaching that you will have gotten to prepare you for service on Sunday, now on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, if we we'll quickly go into our word today, because today is communion service as well, so we have a packed evening. I'll do my best to cut this word short, even though it's a lot of word, but we'll see what we do. We're in the fourth installment of the series, The Wisdom of the Seed. The Wisdom of the Seed, we're in the fourth installment. And last week we looked at Jesus as the seed. Hallelujah. We talked, we did went through a lot a, a bit of logic. We said if the word of God, if the seed is the word of God, hallelujah. And the word of God is Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is the, is the seed. Now, if the harvest is in the seed, therefore the harvest is in Jesus. Do you remember? So today we want to quickly go to the purpose and the value of the seed. The purpose and the value of the seed. The purpose and the value of the seed. When we, towards the end, if we have time, I'll begin to show you some wisdom that can only come from the seed. Hallelujah. So today our focus is actually on, in the word of God and how it is deployed to be wisdom for the age. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, um, everywhere you go, you hear all kinds of strategies. And in the end, if you are observant and discerning and you do a trace, the bulk of them come from the Bible. They might have been refined, and now when I say refined, it's not necessarily for value, but for language and stuff like that and for marketability. But everything about success that we're looking for comes from the Bible, hallelujah. Amen. And what is more successful than the word of God deployed? Praise Jesus. So if you quickly go with me to Mark chapter 4, remember that's one of the scriptures where we have the parable of the seed. But I'm going to read another parable today. Before I read the parable, I want to read in verse 31 and 32. I want you to remember Mark chapter 4, verse number 14. It says, The sower soweth the word. Hallelujah. Amen. The sower soweth the word. Hallelujah. Now, if you go to Mark chapter 4 from verse 31, I'm reading from the um, King James Version. It will say, no, let's even read from verse 30. It says, and he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. That when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, 
so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Praise Jesus. Amen. We are looking at the word as a seed now, but we are looking at a specific seed. We are looking at the seed that the Bible refers to as the what? The grain of mustard seed. This is one of the tiniest seeds that abounds. But it's seen that you put it in the ground and you don't even know what happens underneath the ground where you have put it. Ultimately, it grows up and becomes this huge tree with great branches so that fowls may lodge under the shadow of it. Praise Jesus. So what, start, what started out as small ends up becoming something of such tremendous value in the end. Praise Jesus. Amen. Praise Jesus. Amen. Now when you take a look at the word of God, the Bible says something and most of the time, you know, in my line of work, people come to you with very heavy, serious, many things. And when they finish and you say to them, the answer is in the word of God, they look at you like, no pill, because we've been told to distill everything into something we can pop in our mouths. Or some people expect that there's something you can shoot in your veins. People expect that there's somewhere you can go. And so this is the bane of Christianity. Because it is that simple. Take a word, apply it, and it works. A lot of us don't believe it. It is too simple to make sense. Hallelujah. We looked at it in the last two weeks. But the word of God says it like it says the Foolishness. He said that wisdom, the Lord uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and he uses, he uses what? The weak things to confound the strong. So, the word of God, if you look at it on the sheet of paper, is almost inconsequential. It's another book of stories. But when you take it and you are God to make it flesh. Remember what we were talking about two weeks ago? It takes on a dimension that brings in a result that nobody can get say. I don't care what any other person is saying. I have tasted the word of God and it works. The psalmist says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's through his word. And what I want us to do today is take a look at the word and ask ourselves, why is the word of God so valuable? What is the value in this word of God? How do I get to deploy it? What are some of the things that I can deploy it in? Because this actually is the wisdom of the seed. How do you take something as ordinary as a string of words and make it into something that continues to give life? In John chapter 6 verse 63, Jesus said, he says, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. What that automatically means that is that every word that emanates from the mouth of God is life-giving. Remember last week we, talk, we called it spirit word. That the word ought to be spirit word. Any word that is not spirit word is a trouble word. In the first service today we looked at a few things. And we looked at in 1 Samuel chapter 16. That when the spirit of God came upon David, the spirit and um, the, the, the spirit it lifted off, the spirit of God lifted off so, and an evil spirit came upon him. And I did say that there are no empty spirits of men running roaming around. So there's nothing like that man is empty. There are two things that can happen to a man and two things alone. He's either filled with the spirit of God or he's filled with the spirit of the devil. So there is no in-between. And because there is no in-between, I need the word of God to work for me. I'm not talking about you. It's okay if you don't want it. I need this word to work for me. I've tried many things prior to this time. I just need the word to work. And I have heard that the word works. And indeed, I have seen that the word works. I have seen by the word someone is taken out of the grace of cancer. I have seen by the word someone's life is turned around a total 360 degrees. I have seen the word work. And so, I need to know how it works. That's what this is about. There's something I've said over and over and over in the course of this series. And it is that the harvest is in the seed. I said the harvest is, is in, the seed, in the seed. I say it also in this way. I say every seed is a potential harvest. That every seed is a potential harvest. The next thing I'm about to say to you now, you want to pay attention because it's just as important. 
And that is the fact that every seed has both a purpose and a value. Every seed has both a purpose and a value. If the seed that is cast in the ground is not valuable, there would not have been need for us to create scarce crows so that they don't best don't come and dig up the, the seed that is in the ground. If the word of God was not valuable, if it was not accessed into the kingdom, the Lord will not commit over six, seven parables to the kingdom and the seed. Praise Jesus. Amen. In John 15, 15 chapter 7, John 15, 7, it says, If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Very simple. That's how effective the word of God is. As long as I'm abiding in God and his word is abiding in me, guess what? I get to have whatever I ask. People say that's too easy. So therefore, it must be for some caliber of people. I say no, it's for everyone. Because the last time I checked Mark chapter 11, it's whosoever. It has never said something about those who live a lucky. It's never said anything about those who fly business class. It's never said anything about those who wear designer outfits. It's never said anything about the man of one wife. Funny enough, it just says, so ever. Hallelujah. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, the Bible says that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable, number one, for doctrine, number two, for reproof, number three, for correction, number four, for instructions in righteousness. So that what will happen, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So therefore, it is the word of God that is the equipping tool for good works. The word of God is the equipping tool for success. The word of God is the equipping tool for effectiveness. No word of God stored in you, no effectiveness. Praise the Lord. So when we focus on the word, it is commonly because of stuff, however. What does that mean? I come to the word when I'm sick. So I suddenly remember that there's a scripture that says that, what does it say? I shall not put the diseases of the Egyptians upon me. So, uh, it's the Lord that he likes me. So I now begin to chant it like a mantra. That's not how you deploy the word of God. What John chapter 15 says is that the word abides in you. That is the word is on the inside of you. Now I can understand and I do appreciate that depending on how long ago you got into this journey with God, you may not know all the scriptures, yes? But when you begin to learn them, learn them for safekeeping inside of you. Because I've said it many times. Let me say it one more time. The devil does not give notice before he shows up. He just shows up. And when he shows up, you can't say to him, I, I'll come answer the door later. Let me get my Bible and look for my concordance. That's not the way it works. He comes to you in totally unprepared times. And you better have the word stored inside of you. We have become a generation of Christians who don't open the Bible. We don't open the Bible anymore. No. There is a lingo for everything. And so there are more preaching pastor than you hear anything directly quoted from the Bible. There's, yeah, get on! That more, more of that than anybody opening the scripture and saying, I don't know where it is. They don't even bother to tell you to open the scripture anymore. They just tell you. They know you will not check anyway. So whatever I said to you today, you may think it's true. For all you know, it's not true. Because you will not go back and check. And so the power in the world seems to be reducing on a daily basis. Maybe that's not exactly what is happening. What's happening is that I am refusing to apply myself into the, in, the, in, the, in the word. Because of that, I've not been able to take enough of the word inside of me to keep the devil out when he shows up. So we focus, you see us running to the word because we need something. So we copy it out. The thing is, you are in trouble. Even when you are in trouble and you get the word, okay, because something must bring somebody sharp. 
So when you now have the word, why don't you continue to imbibe it? Why do you wait for trouble number two before you run again and go and move for what the Bible says about trouble number two? So I didn't want to train you with trouble every single day. It's trained though. And it works. I'm just wondering whether that's the best way. Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When I see the scripture, the image that jumps at me is that I'm actually going through a path and I can't find my way. And by the word of God, you know, I just see the word of God moving. In, in my mind, the word of God was in the dark. And so I follow the glow of the word of God and it takes me surely to where I'm headed. A light, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And if you truly understand the word of God, that's exactly what it does. Something just pops up inside of you. And the moment that word settles in your spirit, I don't know about you, but what it does for me is that there's a strength that suddenly comes upon me regardless of what I'm faced with. Because now I know a word. On Friday, we were just running, we had just actually rounded off our retreat. And my son comes and says, Mommy, come. I step out and he says, You need to call to care. And I'm like, What's the problem? He said, Well, you know that um, paper that she spent so much time in writing? I said, Yes. He said, Well, um, it looks like she submitted it in draft. So the results have been released and she doesn't have a result in that course. She says, you need to call her, because she has called her brother and she has asked for prayer like 15 times. I'm grateful to God that my children need to know to call to ask for prayer. But I said to his, her brother, I said, I'm coming. Let me go and pray with her aunties first, I'm coming. I will call her, but let me go and pray. So we came in, it wasn't five minutes, we prayed, and someone said, oh, let her do a screenshot so that, so I came back out to say to Kiki, they said she needs to do a screenshot, da 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 da. So he went up, and I came back inside. Then like 10 minutes later, I said, let me go back and ask. So have you told her that the email she's doing to the school, all this time I've not called her. And you need to recognize that sometimes these things happen to teach your children how to rely on heaven. I still haven't called and I said, okay, have you told her now that she needs to do a screenshot of the draft in, the, in, in her draft folder so that they will know because the dates will show. And that was what I was going to ask. I'm going to say, little oh, mommy, don't worry, it's been resolved. Hallelujah. She got an A. Hallelujah. Somebody will say it's coincidence. Now you sabi. I'm not, I'm, I'm not arguing with you. But I do know that if that thing had continued, Dukia's grandma would have put me on a plane this morning. And just the fact that it did not follow through in the direction it seemed to be going, I know the word of God works. I know the word of God works. I know the word of God works. So every time you need to go somewhere, it's the word of God that should actually be your map. It's your GPS, turn left, turn right. Stand still for a moment, the light is red. But what do we find? Christians who have no idea what the Bible is meant for. So what you can see from the scriptures I've read, I read John 15 verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, um, Psalm 119 verse 105. The first thing I want you to see, and I've talked about it already, so I'll just mention it and move on because of time, is that the word of God shows up the way. That is why it's a seed that is bound to yield a harvest. Hallelujah. It shows us the way. We have the word of God to guide our every move. As human believers, and I did say that human believers, you like what? How many other types of believers are there? I don't know. I just know that me am a human believer. The when I use the expression human believer, I mean flesh and blood us, because of the things that we are prone to. There are many things that we cannot see <laughs> with our ordinary eyes. But you can see if you follow the leading of the word. It was the leading of the word by the word that I saw all of you seated in this hall. 
And today in the physical, I can see you. I knew this was my nest. Everybody said to me, it does not have the rhythm. I agree with them, it still does not have any kind of rhythm. But I saw it by the word. So the, the only thing I could do was go and try the word. If I get there and it doesn't work, I'm not too weak to say I made a mistake. But you see, if I saw it by the word, I'm not sure of it. So the word of God shows us the way. That's why if you ask anyone who's been in here long enough, on what scripture is um, what's this, um, the well I'm called on? Who can tell me? Romans? 8.19 eh? For all of creation earnestly awaits the manifestation of the sons of God. I saw it by the word. So I had wasn't clear, I wasn't sure who would come. But since I saw it, I figured it's myself and Jesus are the most important people to show up. Not because I'm all that, but because someone had to open the door anyway. So you guys might have seen it in the spirit, but none of you was asked to open the door. So you were waiting for the one who had the key to open the door. All I did was open the door. I don't think I did beyond opening the door. That's all that I did. But you are seated here today. And there are many more of you on their way. Amen. Do you understand this? Amen. So the word of God shows us the way. Isaiah 30 verse 4. It says, And thy ears shall hear a voice behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left hand. The thing I like about the word of God is it can follow you everywhere. If you remember Psalm 139, it says, If you make your bed in hell, you can't run from this one. In Psalm 119, verse 111, it says, Thy, thy word have I hid in my heart. His word is seed for reproof and correction. One common to all of us that are in this room is that we have blind spots. Even the smartest of us. We have what? Blind spots. Which means that there are things that we are not able to see by ourselves. Not because others can't see them. But we cannot see them. We all have blind spots. These spots give us the illusion that we are perfect. I'm yet to see someone who writes about themselves, unless they are writing historical events. But I'm yet to see someone who, first thing when he shows up, is I'm not a good person. All of us have blind spots, and because we have blind spots, what happens? We think that the world revolves around us and the way we do things. So therefore, if I did it this way, it had to be the best way to do it. Do you understand it? That's why, and then some of us, especially if we are in leadership, especially if we are in leadership, the big challenge is nobody can tell us that we are lying to ourselves. Because everyone is tiptoeing around us anyway. That's why a believer that will not open himself to the word of God is in trouble. Because in those kinds of situations, it is only the word of God that will catch your attention and say, man, it's your, this thing you are doing is not the life. There is something you need to adjust for reproof and for correction. So when you are, especially in leadership, sometimes you know that you can't, and I'm not dissing anyone, I'm just telling you the truth that you need to understand that there are some truths that no one will tell you. And so you need to make the word your ally because the word will show you. Praise Jesus. You can't beat the word. Come malice the word. Even if you malice the word, he's not hearing. But he can tell you. In Luke 22, 31, Peter had a major blind spot. What was his blind spot? Peter thought he loved Jesus enough to never, 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 never deny Jesus. 
So Jesus said to him, you, before the cock will crow three times, I'll be twice. Twice, you will deny me three times. Peter said, me. I will even die with you. In fact, prove it now. You killed me by yourself. You can see that I'm ready to die with you. And Jesus said, said the devil has sought to sift you, but I have prayed for you. Peter was still looking at Jesus and said, Jesus, what are you talking? This is no. It's no time remember where you took me from. It's not possible that I would deny you. A few hours later, the cock rose the second time. Jesus looks up and catches Peter's attention. And Peter suddenly remembers. Do you know the darkest thing? Peter did not remember. This is not willful disobedience. This was total blind spot. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. When the cock crowed, Peter remember, was reminded, and the Bible records that he wept so. Mm. Number three, the word keeps us from sin. The word of God keeps us from sin. I know we don't like to hear this because we've become believers who don't know the difference between sin and life. We actually think that life is spelled S I N C. And so when you see someone who talks about sin, you're thinking, where's that person judgment? That's what they tell you. They are judging. Don't judge. I, I, I shouldn't judge. You just give me opportunity to judge. I've been all here that even if I don't judge you, the world has judged you already. So let me just help the world and judge you. Because apparently if you were listening to the word, you would have heard by now. I'm just saying. And it goes for me too. I'm not, I've never, never, never told anyone that I was perfect. The word keeps us from sin. If you read the book of Genesis chapter 4, Cain could have been saved. God spoke to him. He said, if you do well, he says, sin is crouching at your door. Just be careful. He said, leave me in the house. By the time King was coming back, he was coming to bed. He said, put a mark on me. Let no man kill me. That was something that was totally avoidable. The word spoke, but he was not listening. My prayer is that you will listen in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that in the day of his power, his people shall be willing. I declare over you this afternoon that in the day of the power of God, you will be willing. I will be willing. The world will be willing. A family in, 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 in what's it? online will be willing in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Number four, God's word gives understanding to the simple. God's word gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 119 verse 130. That's what it says. It says God's word gives understanding to the simple. Now when you try to trace the or define the word simple, and if you look at the different versions of the Bible, three words jump out. The first one is untrained. So when you see Psalm 119 um, verse 130, the word of God gives understanding to the untrained. And I have seen this happen. Those days, you know, early on when we were in the first time area, there was this young man that was evangelized in a motor park. Pastor Sue. That's who he is. That was evangelized in a motor park. He had understood a few broken English. But he was very fluent in it. And that was all. So they brought him into church and he'll come. He Decided to come. After a while, my pastor was a, I think it was a GM of Excelsior Hotel then, decided to take him out of the park and took him to Excelsior Hotel to work and put him in the laundry department. So when the boy is done laundry, he'll just sit down there and he'll be reading, he'll be trying to read a Bible that he couldn't speak English. At the end of the one year, this boy could read in the English language and could speak it. By the time he was leaving Lagos, he went off and he started, he had to go start a parish of something somewhere in Oka. This is true life. I saw him walk into the place and he needed an interpreter. I saw him come back like six years later, preaching fire and brimstone. Because the word of God brings understanding to the untrained. Hallelujah. Amen. The word of God, another word that you find from the word simple is inexperienced. 
The word of God gives understanding to the inner experience. I don't know how many of you have ever actually prayed when you are new to something and say, Holy Spirit, teach me this thing. You'll be amazed what the Holy Spirit can teach you. People, when people talk to me and I say to them, they will now say to me what I did with my native intelligence. That's what I call it. They will not give it one really fancy scientific or strategic name that I do not know. Holy Spirit told me I did it. So I call it native intelligence. You know why it's native intelligence? Because the Holy Spirit is native to me. The third word that you'll find out of the simple is gullible. And to confess the whole truth, there are times that I'm untrained. Many things in which I'm untrained. There are times, many times in which I'm inexperienced. And of course, there are just times that I'm just going. It's the truth. And nobody here is exempt from this three. So the simpleton is not necessarily a fool. It's someone who's lacking a grasp of something in some area. And the Bible says the word of God brings understanding to that person. Praise Jesus. The word of God gives us life, number five. I talked to you about John chapter 6, verse 33. The words that I have spoken to you, they are what? Spirit and they are life. Proverbs chapter 4, 22. The word of God is life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. I find that the more you apply and deploy God's word to situations and circumstances that others read as, as dead, they gradually begin to receive life. Praise Jesus. They gradually begin to receive life. I've seen a child who was on the autistic spectrum and by prayer is moved away from that spectrum. Just the word of God. The Bible says, the, the, the prayers will say that the, the, you know, Daniel was wiser than his peers. I declare the wisdom of God. God puts upon you the grace for wisdom and understanding. They just continually speak the word of God. I know somebody is in their living room around laughing and saying, you better take the child to a specialist. Well, your circles. Because I've seen the word of God do it. Praise Jesus. The in most interesting part of the word of God is the word of God changes us to become like God. Yeah. And you find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Everything about your journey is to arrive at the fullness of the Spirit. It's nothing but the word. I told us at the beginning of this entire journey of um, the wisdom of the seed that that's why the Bible says that God exalted his word above his name. Now he's given a name by which all men shall be saved. But the word is exalted above that name. I know people don't agree with me. But I, I like to ask a question that sounds really blasphemous. And it is, have you ever said in Jesus' name and what you said it concerning did not happen? The question it will be real. Have you ever said in Jesus' name and then the thing you prayed that you rounded off in Jesus' name did not happen? Have you ever? Yes. yes. Oh, you've been disappointed by the Jesus' name before. <laughs> I just said it. I'm not going to buttress for you to come from my head. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what is the wisdom of the seed? What wisdom does the word of God hold? What wisdom does the word of God hold? Because sometimes it's not that you don't know these things. It's just that they are not made properly for you. Praise God. And how many of us know that if you've never seen some grains before, that they are grains, even if they are edible, and they're just put in different portions of some, um, what's that thing called, and display something and put there. How many of us recognize that? You may not know which is poisonous or which is edible. But when your grains are properly labeled, you can tell without a shadow of doubt which one you should be eating. Am I correct? Yes. So some of the things I'm talking about today are not new to you. You just didn't label them properly. 
Yeah, we life that myself and my husband, we will be doing stuff. We just know inside of us that is the right thing to do, so we continue to do them. If you ask us why we are doing it, we can't even tell you it's in the Bible. We just know it's the right thing to do. Then one day we go somewhere and someone is teaching, and then he draws out the principle. Me and my, me and Mark will look at each other like, oh, so this is what we've been doing. He named it for us. That he named it two years after we were doing it does not mean that it just appeared. Do you understand? But I want, what I'm trying to do therefore is bring to your consciousness some wisdom that comes from the word that you are not paying attention, probably. The wisdom of identity. The wisdom of identity. Everything that anything will become flows from there and its identity. Praise Jesus. In Genesis 1 verse 26, I talked to them, the Bible talks about let, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And then when you get to verse 28, it now says replenish the, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. And in the first service, we had looked at that. And what it was that we were talking about was that your identity, your, your, your identity supports your mandate. And it is the word of God that brings you to that place where you are, you are able to marry identity and, 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 and mandate. Now, the most general way I can put it to you so that you understand it is that every single one of us has something that is, we've been tapped in our spirit to become. Now, because that tag exists in your spirit, you cannot go and do something and not try to bring what you have done to marry it to your tag. Do you understand it? Rather, you take your tag and you use your tag to navigate your way to what you will produce. That's why I say the word of identity because what that means is that your identity is so powerful that if you just know who you are in God, then you can do anything in God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 is very clear. I carry God's DNA. And 28 tells me God made me make some quantum to me that it requires a profiting from. And so I can't have lived unless I have pro I have produced, I'm fruitful, I have multiplied, I have replenished, I have subdued, and I have had dominion. And it is knowing who I am that and that entrenches me on the path that I never give up until I get where I need to go. Hallelujah. I recognize by the wisdom of, um, of, of identity who I am, and I ensure I walk and act like who I am. The clearest example I can give to you is a king who is in captivity. Let's say a king went to war and he was captured among some of his subjects. Do you know that every morning when his subjects wake up, they bow to him? He's a captive king, he's handcuffed and stuff like that, but his subjects never forget who he is. They know that today he might be in prison, but when they come, they still go that cabbie is thing to him. Why do you think? Because your identity can be eroded. Now the problem is there are a lot of children of God who are children of God, but because they are not very settled in that identity, everything they do, that's why the, um, the, the, the preacher man said it in the Ecclesiastes. He said, I've seen one terrible thing in the earth. He said, I've seen beggars ride and princes beg. It is the prince who doesn't know his identity that was begging. The wisdom of identity. Wisdom number two. The wisdom of the wisdom of discipline. The word of God produces in us the wisdom of discipline. And what does this mean? It just means that by the word of God you can set parameters. The word of God can tell you when you need to expand. It can tell you when you need to shrink stuff in. The word of God is available for every situation and every scenario. Praise Jesus. In, 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 in Isaiah 54, it talked about enlarging the place of your tent because it was time to break forth to the left and to the right. So you had to adjust your parameters to be able to take what is coming. Praise Jesus. And there, other time, there was another time in the book of John, he said, decrease. Then there was another time by the word, he said, come higher. The wisdom of discipline means that by the word of God, you should be able to tell when to invest and when to pull out. <laughs> okay, let me just dash you something that the Lord 
told me on Friday. The Lord told me on Friday, and this is for those of us who invest, listen very carefully. He said, grudge holders cannot be successful investors. But we decode it another time. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Wisdom of discipline. Discipline determines how I exercise my identity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 17, the Bible talks about coming out from among them. With the child of God, there are no shades of gray. Is it that black or it is white? Anything in between, not God, I promise you. Jesus says, I see my father. I do what I see my father do. As I see my father do, so I do. That's what he says. That's that by, by the word of God, you ought to know what you should put your hand to and what you should not. Some opportunities are great opportunities. They are not just according to your tag. So they are they'll be brought to you. And if you are sensitive and you are being led by the word of God, what should happen is you should direct them to the one whose target is. It's not everything you put your hand on as a child of God. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Hallelujah. Wisdom number three, the wisdom of, of discernment. What is discernment? The ability to know something others may not know. The capacity to correctly read situations and circumstances. That's the segment. It's a fruit of the spirit. This wisdom empowers us to build the relationships and empowers us for daily interactions. If there is an example I have in the Bible of someone who knew the segment well, his name is Nehemiah. How Nehemiah, a cup bearer, would get a king to sign up, sign off on letters to build, rebuild the entire city of Jerusalem. Only God can tell. There was a discernment that he had. He knew the time had to be right. If there's another example I need to give to you, actually, I can't give that as an example because that was a gamble. Esther was a gamble. She prayed and she said, If I perish, I perish. But Nehemiah not so. He showed up. There was a confidence with him. In fact, he didn't ask. The king asked him, what do you want? The spirit or the wisdom of discernment. Hallelujah. Wisdom makes me dance. The wisdom of, of creation. The wisdom of creation. The wisdom of creation. A lot of us have been trying to create. Because we think that creation begins with our hands touching something. Meanwhile, creation begins with an instruction being released. You will get it in 2020, maybe 20, 22. You are getting it now. The wisdom of creation, the capacity to release an instruction from heaven by the word of God and then watch that, watch that word begin to hover and begin to bring forth the things that it ought to bring forth. The Bible says it like this. I think it's Psalm 119, 119 verse 89. It said, the word that I have released cannot return to me void until it accomplishes that for which I did what? Sent it. The wisdom of creation. There is a word that creates children. <laughs> there is a word that brings forth wealth. The wisdom of creation. Then you have to have Because God 
will always arrive if it will solve some, something. Number two, you need to look at the intelligence. <laughs> you need to look at the intelligence of God. Think about it very carefully. There is nothing that heaven has created that it did not come perfect. Somebody asked me a question yesterday. I said, um, if God's creation is perfect all the time, what happens to children who are born with genetic effects? And I have not answered her, but if she's watching, the answer is found in the original intent. Because Lazarus was going to die. And Jesus declaring creation by the word of God, you are not supposed to have a, a, a shade of doubt because God's word is perfect. The fourth thing is you need to take a look at the investment of God. You need to take a look at the investment of God. Everything that God brought forth, he invested something in. When he wanted to find fish, he invested in the, in the water, in the sea. When he wanted to find fowls, he invested in the air. His instruction was to, he ne when he wanted fish, he did not speak to the air. When he wanted fowls, he did not speak to the water. Because everything will bring forth from its kind. So you need to check, where is God investing now? What has he invested in me? Because everything you are jumping from pillar to post for, investment you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The master, to master the wisdom of creation, we must, we must learn that the word went from the word that creation without intention is a failed exercise. Do I need to say that again? Creation without intention is a failed exercise. Creation without intention is a failed exercise. Number two th thing you need to take a look at and recognize and hold on to and learn because we're talking about the wisdom of creation. Remember, it's my favorite one, so I don't dip. Is that to see, you must see that. See that God's design is fail proof. God's design is fail proof. God's design is fail proof. There is nothing you will do to the design of God. It stands sure. It stands sure. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. What that means is that God's design is so perfect that you can neither add to it nor take away from it. Read your Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 11. It says he's made all things beautiful in his own time. None can add to it, none can take away from it. The third thing that you must understand when you are looking at the wisdom of creation is to see that everything God created is an investment to his intention or an investment in his intention. God doesn't just put something in any man that he has no plan to deploy. Hallelujah. Amen. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 12 and Jeremiah 51 verse 15, it says, God made the earth by his power and established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Three things you need to see. Wisdom, understanding. All of these are captured in the wisdom of creation. Hallelujah. Amen. 
in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19 to 20, says almost the exact same thing. Say the earth was founded by wisdom and understanding established the heavens. Hallelujah. In essence, Genesis chapter 1, 28, the mandate that man is received to go and make, found, establish by his wisdom. That's what it is. That's why in Deuteronomy here, yeah, 8.22, this is God, 8.18, is God that giveth us the power to get wealth. There is nothing you are looking to rule by that you find anywhere but apart from the word of God. The fifth wisdom that you need to embrace from the world is the wisdom of fruitfulness. The wisdom of fruitfulness. In John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, since by his word we know that we can only produce when we abide. What this means is that you are cut off, then you cannot produce. You take a hike, then your productivity ends. This is, this is wisdom because some of us for many years brought forth nothing of value because we didn't abide in him. A man who is wise enough and wants to bring forth and wants to be fruitful knows that all he needs to do is stay what we call in a Nigerian song under the canopy of God. All you need to do is just stay where you are planted. Just remain. It doesn't matter whether you are just a leaf. It doesn't matter whether you are a branch. It doesn't matter whether you are the root. It doesn't matter whether you are the Just stay where you are. You will find yourself producing. Hallelujah. So therefore, what is wisdom beginning? Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. That's the easiest thing that I can tell you. All this information that I've given you is still useless until you apply it. The great thing about wisdom is it becomes better as you try to begin to do what you have heard by the word of God. Praise Jesus. This is important in this series, The Wisdom of the Seed. Because if I don't lay this foundation, when I come next Sunday and I begin to talk about the seed, it will look like I'm speaking French and I'm not even good at French. So I'm able to see that everything that one God wants to achieve in the earth today, He's tapped your, your, your spirit to achieve a part of it. And the manual. Is this book? The manual is this book. You want success? You want money? Looking for health? It's all here. I don't know who did this song, but it's, it ends something like this. It says, whatever you need, you can find in the world. You need, you can find in the world. Whatever you need, you can find in the world. Whatever you need, you can find in the world. Guys, this is the journey we're on. The journey to take the word of God and sit with it until it produces something tangible for our lives. The people who truly know how to deploy the word of God, they, you don't see them running back and forth. There is a calm around them, regardless of what is burning, because they know something that all of us do to be. You see this word? It works. This, in fact, I think, I can't prove I think I've actually looked at word before. I'm looking at the Bible, and the words begin to move. And they begin to move and arrange for what I need. You need to get to that place. The easiest way to do it is to give priority to the word of God up and above anything else. People say, oh, what are all the other things you are doing at the web? I say, we're well, in teaching church. Like, is that all? I say, if you know the power that comes from the word, you will not be asking this question. And you don't you have the ten steps? No, we don't have the ten steps. We have the one step by the word. Because that's what works anyway. But it's not as attractive as we want it to be. Sometimes it doesn't as fast as we want. But it is still. 
still the only thing that produces anything that endures. So ladies and gentlemen, pro roll. I introduce you to, to you today the one thing that is infallible. The one thing that never changes. The one thing that is the same answer that can answer to any question. The one thing that has been tested from generation to generation and it's never failed. I introduce you the word of God, aka Jesus. If you have missed, maybe you're watching online or you're here and you have not given your life to Jesus. What can I say? That's your first step in this journey of trusting something that most people don't trust anymore. I'll need you to pray with me. Seven short words. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. As we're praying that prayer, and the rest of us are telling the Lord, help me to give your word. I want um, um, Pastor Vaz, Lashawan, um, Ungazi, please come and take the communion ground. Father Lord, we bless this bread and wine symbolically